Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, welcome. Welcome to our uh, plenary panel on national security and international law. Uh, my name is Julian Ku, and I'm a professor of constitutional and international law at the Maurice A. Dean School of Law here at Hofstra. Um, I am delighted and honored uh, to be asked to moderate this panel today with a distinguished group of former administration officials and scholars. Uh, I look forward to a very interesting and important discussion on a very uh, complicated and important topic. Um, so today we'll, he uh, we'll hear the views from some of the leading US government officials of the Bush administration on the several different ways in which national security policy intersected with international law um, especially the international law of armed conflict, the international law of human rights, and other aspects of international law. Our perspectives are not just that of law, because I ventured out of law school, so we can talk about other stuff. Um, but of course, of history and policy as well. Now, for the Bush administration, um, as most of you know, most of the intersections of international law and national security policy occurred in the context of the war on terrorism. But that's not the whole picture, as some of our panelists will also discuss. Uh, while it is interesting and important to think about how the policy decisions looked at the time they were made, I also think that this conference and the passage of time should allow us to assess or even reassess those policy decisions in the light of the past seven years. Okay. So the format will be as follows. First, we'll hear opening remarks from each of our panel members. Um, and depending on time, I'll ask them to add to or clarify their remarks. But then we'll have plenty of time for questions um, from the audience. After this first panel is concluded, we'll take a short break and reconvene with comments and reactions from our scholarly uh, participants. Um, now, you may have noticed that although we have uh, four microphones set out for our panel, uh, two of them are empty. We're uh, it's two like of our the Clint Eastwood moment. Yeah, the <laughs> right. We'll have we'll we'll be debating the empty chair. Um, uh, two of our two of our panelists, uh, and that's why I was just emailing. Um, two of my panel, two of our panelists are are are. Somewhere very close, but not quite here yet. Um, in an undisclosed location. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll appear in some um, mysterious way, uh, maybe by drone or something. Um, so they will, but they'll be here very shortly. But we will launch the discussion first um, by hearing uh, first from uh, General Michael Hayden, and I'll introduce each panelist right before they speak rather than introduce the panel as a whole. So we'll begin first by hearing from General Michael V. Hayden. Uh, currently a principal of the Chertoff Group, an Air Force general, Mr. Hayden played a central role in the formation and implementation of U.S. intelligence policy. Uh, he served beginning in 1999 as director of the National Security Agency, then the principal deputy director of national intelligence, and then finally as director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, he has a lot of other titles and, and career accomplishments, but um, I don't want to take up any more of that time. So. Without further ado, I'll first turn it over uh, to Professor Hayden to, uh, for his remarks, to General Hayden for his Thank remarks. Thank you, Julian. Um, I think there are a lot of things to be said. I just came from a, uh, a breakout session having to do with the unitary executive and separate and co-equal branches of government. And I, I suspect we'll get to commentary about that before we're done in, in terms of what the Bush administration did or did not do. But as Julian said, the, the focus for this one is the inter intersection of the Bush administration's policy and international law, uh, foreign relationships, foreign intelligence relationships, which we call liaison uh, in the business. I I'm, I'm going to be very brief, but, but I, but I want to mention what I think is an incredibly central point, that there, there are a lot of specific issues between what the United States thought was lawful and appropriate with regard to the war on terror and what many of our allies, and, and frankly, here, when we say many of our allies, we're talking about the Europeans. Right? I, I, I've not had this conversation with any of our Arab allies. Right? But there were folks in Europe, particularly Western Europe, particularly our, our closest traditional allies, who, as the war on terror went forward, saw more and more daylight between what we thought was lawful and appropriate and what they did. So what I want to relate to you is a talk I gave in the spring of 2007 at the German embassy. The uh, Germans were in the chair of the European Union at the time, 
and the German ambassador, Ambassador Scheriroth, um, would have, and I have to say this carefully to be precise, would have the ambassadors to the United States from the states of the European Union over to the German residents for lunch. And he would do that about every two weeks. And for several of these meetings, as part of the lunchtime entertainment, he would have an American official come in to talk about some aspect of American policy. I suspect Secretary Gates went. I suspect Secretary Rice went. He invites me. And so I, 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 I happily went, went to the lunch. And I decided, you know, th this is going to be a, a gathering among friends. And I, I, as director of CIA, which I was at the time, we really need to take advantage of this. And so I decided that for this pleasant lunch we're going to have at the German residence, I would talk about renditions, detentions, and interrogations. Okay? And I had a wonderful speech writing staff at CIA. But, you know, a heavily academic audience, you know what I mean. You can't leave anybody else's prose alone. You, you have to change things. But in this particular speech, I just wasn't adjusting adverbs. This one I actually took a pretty strong personal interest in. And I obviously remember what it was I said, because I'm going to tell you what I said on about page two or three of my speech. And I began by saying we're among friends. Um, but let me tell you what I believe, what my agency believes, what my government believes, and frankly, what my countrymen believe. Number one. We are a nation at war. We are at war with Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. This war is global in scope, and I can only fulfill my legal and moral responsibilities to the citizens of the republic. I can only fulfill those responsibilities by taking this war to that enemy wherever they may be. Four sentences, nation at war, Al-Qaeda and affiliates, global, take the fight. There was not another country in that room that agreed with any of those four sentences. Not only did they believe they did not apply to them, they thought it was illegitimate for us to think that way, for us to think that applied to us. But that was fundamentally the American approach to, to this conflict. It was a fascinating conversation. And after I got done with the remarks, Ambassador Sherry both kind of had an organized, guided discussion. And as we're, we're, we're getting near the end, uh, I'm standing up, and he's where Peter is sitting down. And he looks up at me and says, well, General, you know, you, you must admit, we are all, and he kind of did the European wave over the table, we, we are all children of the Enlightenment. To which I responded, yes, sir, yes, sir, Mr. Ambassador, we really are. But you all seem to be focused on Locke, and we're kind of hung up on Hobbes. <laughs> okay. And then at the very end, I said, you know, I really appreciate this, and this was an exchange of views among friends. It really was. I said, but here's the thing. I'm going to get in the black SUV out here, and I'm going to go back to Langley. And if i got a folder on my desk that we've got somebody, I got three choices. I can keep them. That's a black site. I can give them to a friend. That's a rendition. Or I can call Don Rumsfeld and say, hey, Don, I got somebody for you. That's Guantanamo. But that's all I got. And so I'm not particularly helped by your kind of folding your arms and, and, and clucking at us from some perceived hill of moral superiority. After President Bush left office, after President Obama was in office, U.S. Navy SEALs from helicopters launched from a helicopter carrier over Somalia conducted a, a raid on a two-car convoy in which the operations chief of Al-Shabaab, the Somali branch of Al-Qaeda, a fellow named Salah Nabhan was, was traveling. Um, the SEALs made no attempt to capture based upon the press accounts. This is after I'm in, out of government. This is President Obama's Department of Defense. No attempt to capture. They used organic weapons aboard the helicopters to spray the two-car convoy based all of this on exquisite intelligence. Landed long enough only to swab up enough of Sala to uh, go back to the ship with DNA evidence that they got the right man. I am here to tell you there is not an intelligence service in Europe who would have given the United States government information to enable that raid 
if they thought the United States was going to use that information to conduct that kind of raid. The point I'm trying to make here is as we discuss the Bush administration's policies and, and what caused irritants in our relationship with traditional allies, and, and, and truly there, there are, and we can certainly mark some of us down for style points during that period, it's not about style. It's about a fundamental definition of what it is we're about that differs from even our best friends. President Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for not being George Bush. And he, he went to Oslo to, to accept his award. And there's a remarkable scene. And the camera would have been up there, okay, looking over the president's shoulder. And you all have to imagine yourself as being the Nobel Committee. And as the president is giving his acceptance speech, the camera kind of looking over his shoulder, and we can see the faces of the Nobel Committee. It really looks like they've all just got a text saying their dog had been run over by a bus because the 44th president of the United States was lecturing the Nobel Committee on just war theory on, and on his responsibilities to defend America and Americans. And I was sitting in Phoenix in August of 2009 when the president spoke to the VFW and he began by saying, we are a nation at war. We are at war with Al Qaeda and its affiliates and we will take this fight to that enemy. And so I, I would just begin before we get into all the specifics about Guantanamo and detentions and targeted killings and military commissions and state secrets and, and who's listening to whose cell phones, okay? That the fundamental distinction between us and our best friends is we've defined this in a dramatically different way. And our way may be right or may be wrong, but it does represent a unified American consensus. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Hayden. And now we'll turn to uh, Professor Peter D. Fever, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Duke University. Uh, Professor Fever is a scholar of, of the presidency and public policy, but he's also, um, I'm sorry, and, but he's, uh, in addition to all You're that, You're not the only also, one who's sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, served a uh, special advisor for strategic planning and social reform at the National Security Council from 2005. Uh, to 2007. So there are, again, there are many other accomplishments I could list, but I, in the interest of time, I'll just turn it over to Professor Fever. Well, thank you, and, and it's uh, good to be here, and I want to thank and congratulate Mina on, on pulling together uh, such an impressive rogues gallery. I, I, I've seen a couple former regime elements that I worked with out in the uh, audience, and it's, it's quite an uh, impressive. I'm honored to be on the panel. Uh, it also, it's nice to be able to talk about national security law without any lawyers present. Uh, so uh, I, I'll try to get my blame of them in before they arrive. I, uh, I want to make five points, and, and I understand the, the exercise very well. This is what I call the tethered goat exercise. We are tied down uh, for the sport of being a... Um, uh, dissected in the uh, in the Q and A, we want to leave plenty of time for that. But I also understand that the exercise requires a little malice self criticism, and so I'm going to begin with two critical comments about the Bush administration in this area, and and then make my uh, three other comments. Uh, the first is that I believe the conventional critique of the Bush administration in the area of national security law is upside down. So the conventional critique is Bush administration played fast and loose with law, international law, national security law, uh, w was reckless in its use of uh, the law. In my experience, the, the problem with the administration uh, was a hyper-legalistic approach to the international law. And let me just give you one example. Uh, there, in contrast with the Clinton administration, which found ways to finesse international legal obligations that they had signed up to but didn't like, and take the Rome Treaty as a good example. Uh, and the politically expedient way of dealing with the Rome Treaty would have been to continue the Clinton way, which is to say we signed it, but we don't intend to uh, honor it. Uh, and what the Bush administration did was to unsign it. 
And this provoked a, a storm of political protest that, uh, that was driven by a legalistic, I think, reading of the force of a presidential signing. Uh, and that a that I thought the Clinton administration had it a little bit better. Maybe it's because I served in the Clinton administration. You mentioned that uh, in when you're describing the things for which I should be ashamed. But uh, <laughs> and I'm not ashamed of my time there. That was uh, that was a great honor to serve there. But they had a more flexible approach. For that matter, President Obama's had a remarkably flexible approach. His his way around the war. Um, Powers Act, I think, is is remarkably innovative and flexible and creative. Uh, and the the administration, the Bush administration, the, had a much more hyper legalistic one. And I've um, I wish I wish Matt and John were here uh, to answer that charge because uh, I, I I wonder if I'm right about that. I might be wrong, but that 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 was my experience. And that's the inverse of the traditional critique. That doesn't mean that the administration got it right. But it means that it, when they got it wrong, it might have been for the opposite reason of what you're thinking. The second criticism I would make, uh, and on this one I know John uh, and Matt agree with me on because I've talked to them about it, uh, but I don't know whether uh, Mike would agree with me. I think Bush 43.1, that is the first term, I think they erred by relying too much on Article 2 and not forging the political consensus that they could have gotten by uh, getting Congress to write, uh, to pass the legislation that they could have gotten. And the reason was I think they, the administration was going for the whole loaf. And the argument was if we go to Congress, we'll only get half a loaf. I think if they had gone to Congress, they would have gotten 80, 85% of the loaf. And that would have been a much, that would have put us in much stronger political footing later on when, uh, when people got, um, well, when they changed their minds about what was uh, the appropriate uh, uh, way to interpret a particular law or the particular policy to go. I think that we should, as an administration, we should have uh, moved more quickly to getting congressional formal buy-in. I mean, obviously, as, as, as General Hayden would tell you, there was extensive briefing of the Gang of Eight, and, and Congress was fully apprised according to what was required. But I think we should have gone beyond what was required and forged the political uh, foundation, and that would have uh, wrong-footed, I think, a lot of the critique. And, and I, by 43.2, uh, that was uh, where we ended up. We were driven there by various Supreme Court rulings and whatnot, but we ended up there, and I think that was the, we, we could have gotten there a little bit faster. So those are my, my two critiques. Uh, my third point is notwithstanding those two critiques, I think the President's, uh, President Bush's overall political, military, legal approach to the global war on terror and to national security more broadly was sound and especially by 43.2, by the second term, it was uh, quite sound. And I think the most eloquent defense of the Bush administration's approach that I have ever heard has been President Obama's actions, because he has largely continued the legal edifice that he inherited, the changes between what he's done and what the administration before him, 43.2 did, are less than either of those administrations want to admit. Far, in my judgment, and maybe we disagree so we could have an argument here, but far more continuity than change. And things that looked obscene, maybe, to Senator Obama running for president have turned out to be pretty sound uh, to President Obama. And boy, did they look a lot like what President Bush thought was needful. And so I think that's a pretty resounding defense of the uh, Bush administration's approach to the war on terror, and national security more generally. And as General Hayden pointed out, it's one that is, is a strong U.S. consensus. It may not be a strong international consensus, but it's a remarkable U.S. consensus. My fourth point, 
is that it, in this pendulum that swings along the continuum of privileging civil liberties or privileging national security concerns. And that's a pendulum that swings back and forth uh, throughout American history. Uh, we obviously, in the immediate wake of 9-11, the pendulum swung, I think, to the, uh, as close to the edge of privileging national security uh, as we've had in my uh, professional life. Um, I would say that the pendulum has reached its opposite apex in the weeks and months after the Snowden leak. So 2013 or thereabouts is when you saw in the American political space, the pendulum swing as far over to the other side, civil liberties, as we've seen in the last 15 years. That pendulum is swinging back. The Snowden momentum is, is uh, uh, eclipsed or is lost or is, has played itself out. Uh, and the events of the last, since that time, particularly the dramatic events of 2014, which is, I think historians will mark as, as one of the more uh, um, dangerous and remarkable unravelings in American geostrategic position. That, that's a very difficult year. And almost with every week, with every month, you saw uh, the pendulum swinging back away from where Snowden had, had dri driven it back to uh, closer to something in the middle. Uh, and this is, I, I could cite evidence for this. There's, uh, you know, President Obama, uh, his policies would be one uh, piece of evidence, but the polling evidence is, is clear too. That uh, even attitudes towards Snowden, you know, is Snowden a hero or, uh, or someone less than a hero? The polling has, has shifted away as the threat, ISIL, rise of Putinism, uh, Chinese adventurism in the South Sea, China Sea, and so forth. As that has become more and more manifest, the public is shifting back towards uh, a perspective that, uh, frankly, reminds me a lot of what the President Bush um, was facing. But. I will concede that that is more of a political policymaker position and less of an academic position. And so my fifth point is to draw your attention to what I think is an interesting policy academic understanding gap. Uh, and I'm not understanding, it's a perspective gap. So let's say state for uh, argument's sake that there is some irreducible threat, some level of risk, homeland security risk, that you can't reduce it below. No matter how hard you try, no matter how hard General Hayden and his team tries, you, there is some risk you can't get it below. So the question is, how much effort should we expend to push the threat down to that irreducible minimum, whatever that minimum is. How aggressively should we work? How close to the line, to the chalk line, should we go? And in my experience, the, my friends in the academy, in, in university, uh, think about that question in a very different way from my friends in the policy world. I have a foot in, in both camps. What I hear from my friends in the academy is this. Since we have to live with some irreducible minimum threat, it must be tolerable. I may not be able to say that politically, but there's some tolerable threat that we have to tolerate. So why are we going to such great lengths to reduce this threat? We're going to have to live with it anyway. And I think that's the way most academics, maybe even the most folks on the panel who are coming after me, think about it. But most policymakers that I've talked to, and I, I would guess that this is where General Hayden would fall and where our two empty chairs would fall, they view it this way. The threat is at this irreducible level precisely because we are going to such extraordinary lengths 
to reduce it. So yes, we understand that we may not be able to have a perfect security policy, but we have reached, we are pushing towards this irreducible minimum risk through aggressive efforts. And that's why you can have this question about, well, why shouldn't we just learn to live with it? We can live with the result of what we get after we have tried our utmost. That tolerable level of risk is the product of all of these, these efforts. And so you get these, the, this dialogue of the deaf where uh, you, you'll get uh, academics, some of my academic friends saying, hey, we haven't had a massive casualty attack on the ho US homeland for years. Why are we making such a big deal of this threat? Meanwhile, General Hayden and his people are saying, we haven't had a mass casualty attack on the homeland precisely because we're making a big deal out of this threat. Uh, and that distinction, I think, is in its essence the distinction between a critic of the policy and someone who's responsible for the policy's outcome. And I think that, I'm sure you've, that's been a theme that's returned many, many times on uh, the national security uh, breakout sessions, that the Bush administration and certainly the people above me uh, who were there on 9-11 had a profound sense of we have a responsibility to protect the American people. And that, that burden uh, drives our calculation in a way that we wouldn't drive us if we were not responsible did not have responsibility for protecting the American people. And with that, I will close. I thought if I vamped long enough, they would make it, but they haven't made it. And so it's uh, over to you on what to do. Yeah, so um, what I'll do is I just got a, there's, believe it or not, the LIE is really just the, the, the problem for all of us, really. Um, so we, we, We've carried these guys before. Yeah, so, yeah right. I know. So what I thought I'd do is I'm going to ask each, uh, each of you to respond to one question, then I'll open it up. If they're not here, I'll open it up. For the audience, we'll just move on. So I really do appreciate your patience, everyone's patience uh, with us. And I, I just wanted to ask a question related to uh, Professor Fever's comments, but also to, uh, which was struck by um, General Hayden's comments. Was there something, and I'll ask each of you maybe if you have thoughts to respond to this, starting with, with General Hayden. I was struck by General Hayden's comments that in presenting the US view of the way the world is organized and the strategy we're taking at war at war against Al Qaeda. We're going to take it to global level, take the war to the enemy. That there was no support by our, from our allies for this point of view. And I think the, the, this, the divide between the United States and some of its allies is, is one of the critiques and one of the themes of, of the Bush years. And the question for each of you, I guess, and you could also say, was it different from Bush one, Bush term one, Bush term two? Was there something that, looking back now after seven years, the US should have done? could have done, the administration should have been able to do, that would have been able to reach out and bring more of the allies on board to keep them, um, so that we didn't have the situation where in 2007, he gave a speech where there was a, seemed to be a stark division between yeah. our views and theirs. I'll, and I'll just start with Professor Hayden, but I'd be curious also if Professor yeah. Fever has a view on this. Maybe not, okay? Because I, I, I do think it, 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 is, it is more than style. So we, we probably could have done without the you're either with us or against us. We, we probably could have skipped over old Europe and New Europe, yeah. okay? I mean, we actually allowed our European friends some top cover to not step up by, by the style with which we may have done or said some things. But, but I do think there's, there, there is a fund, there's been a fundamental break in, in the view of the efficacy of force in international affairs between ourselves and, and Western Europe. And I, it, it evolves out of different 20th century historical experiences, which should be obvious and are, I think, easily understood. But, but we, we, we simply view it as more efficacious than they do. We, we were, after all, the ones who were attacked. We responded in a, in a typically American manner, but it's typically American, not typically Texan, and not typically Bush. It was typically American. That's why the, 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 great, the great continuity. I, I will add. Although they would not enable the strike on Salah Nabhan, all right, if we'd have captured Salah and interrogated them and had valuable information about threats in a particular European country, 
And I called up my counterpart and said, we've got Saul Nabhan, and here's what he's telling us about the threat to Hamburg. Okay, Let me tell you a sentence I would not hear. Well, Michael, wait, don't tell me. I need to know how you elicited this information first before you tell me about this threat warning to the German people. So I, I, never, I never heard that. In addition, um, clearly at the service level, in liaison, I mean, I, I've been in the room where I'm there with my counterpart and his political master, and we're passing on information about people they need not worry about anymore. And, and I, I've had my counterpart tell his political master in a Western democracy, I know, Mr. Minister, that, that we disagree with this policy, but you understand that makes us incredibly more safe because of what it is the Americans are doing. Um, so, I, 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 Julian, I really don't know. The style may have, may have made a difference, but, but this comes down to, to fundamental beliefs, to structures of law, and to historical experiences. This would have been a tough one. So I, I have a slightly different take. Um, I, I think that, uh, th that the gap may not have been as wide as, as you suggested. Be uh, certainly, Prime Minister Blair saw this very similar to uh, President Bush. And one of the great archival uh, troves awaiting future scholars, I know it's not available now, I'm guessing, is the Bush-Blair transcripts. Are they, are they available? Does Jim, do you know if they're available? I don't think they, they're not available yet. When they are, that will be a great uh, dissertation. Because this, the, um, Prime Minister Blair and, and President Bush uh, spoke by secure video um, at least once every other week or, long, or maybe even more frequently than that. And they were wide ranging conversations, everything from what you were, you know, President, you were going to get for your wife for Christmas uh, to logistical matters before them on that week. But the rich stuff is them thinking about the geostrategic environment in which they found themselves and trying to make sense of, uh, of, of that and, and chart a way forward. And I was struck by how uh, much in harmony those two views were. They, were you know, they had slightly different perspectives, of course, but, um, but they saw it uh, more similar than different. And, and so I think uh, that was one leader who, who saw it more similar than different. And there was a, um, a big difference when Sarkozy came in uh, in France. Uh, and so I don't think it's hardwired into the, you know, the European diet that they uh, could not see these problems in a similar way. I'll also note that, uh, that there was a French minister who talked about being at war with radical Islam after Hebdo, which was a phrase that we never would have said. Uh, and uh, so the French sort of got there really quickly with a, a horrific attack, but, but one that still was small compared to 9-11. Um, and so, uh, so I suspect there's more uh, opportunity for overlap. So that's on the one hand. Let me make on the other hand, to make, make your point. Uh, there's no question that the Europeans were frustrated with the United States uh, and with the administration, and and you have the French foreign minister talking about uh, the hyper power, uh, the overweening power, and criticizing the American Secretary of State for describing the U.S. as an indispensable um, nation. Uh, the problem is that that was the Clinton administration that I was just describing. Uh, that this friction that we uh, experienced was uh, endemic to transatlantic relations under the other administration which I served, the Clinton administration. So it's, there's a structural power dimension to this as unrelated to the, the state in which the president came from or his party. Clinton administration were, and by the way, they had a problem with extraordinary renditions as, as, as you know, uh, back in the Clinton administration. So there's, I think there's some structural elements that uh, transcend the Bush administration. There's probably some tonal uh, missteps uh, that the Bush administration uh, followed. And then there's an opportunity for um, traveling together uh, 
as we've seen with the French response, that, uh, that the administration, a, a deft administration, could take advantage of. I, I just want to add, I, Peter's absolutely right. There, there are structural issues, that, that my parting of the ways kind of, kind of description, um, that, that personal relationships do matter, and, and you can begin to buy back, perhaps, some of the, some of the division with, with what I would call retail diplomacy, which President Bush really emphasized, as opposed to wholesale, you know, the big speech and so on. He was, I mean, I've been in the room with President Bush talking about Pakistan, he just yells to the outer office, get me a Musharraf. I mean, that's, that's how he did. So you can, you can buy some of it back, but the structural issues are real. And I just want to make this point. Um, there was a, a, a detainee we had named Binyan Muhammad. He either had a British passport or British residency. And he filed within the British court system um, for, for money, fundamentally. And in the British court process, the British court directed the British government to produce secret documents on Binyan Muhammad's detention. Um, the problem was that they weren't British secrets. They were American secrets that we had shared with the British government. And the British government was unable to protect those American secrets from being disclosed in a British judicial process, which caused me then to write a letter to my counterpart, John Scarlett, who remains a dear friend, saying, John, you do too much more of this, you're not gonna have many American secrets to give your court. Because if you can't control them, then we can't share them. Now that sounds very harsh, but I'm, I'm really not kind of overblowing it. it. It was a really serious issue between us and it was more structural than it was personalities. And even my warm, re I, actually, I have a wonderfully warm relationship with John. So I, I penned this letter, this message, we sent it, and I called him immediately. I said, John, you're getting a really harsh message from me in a few minutes. You need to understand, John, we really mean it. So the, the one other ob observation I'll make is uh, that there does seem to be a, a cultural difference. So I was poo-pooing the cultural uh, explanations, but I do think there is a, something to it. There is a cultural difference about risk acceptance, risk, risk tolerances. And it's not the case that Americans won't accept uh, some risks and the Brits, I mean the Europeans will or vice versa. Uh, it's that in different domains, their positions flip. So contrast the American position to the risk of WMD falling in the hands of um, terrorist groups from state sponsors, which led, the concern about that led to the preventive, preemptive uh, doctrine. And contrast that with genetically modified foods. And what you, the, the positions flip. The, the arguments that are made, the, uh, you could just substitute out the talking points across, they could almost like hand them across the pond and say, okay, now it's your turn. You make the case that we need to be exceptionally, precau uh, the, the precautionary principle requires that we go to extraordinary lengths to stop this, genetically modified foods, or WMD in the hands of terrorists. And it, the logic is the same, but on which side of the issue they fall flips. And I think the only explanation for that is cultural, but I don't have a good explanation for to predict under which of those issues they'll fall, but I know that it's not the same side each time. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, what I'll do now is um, I will actually open it up to uh, questions from the audience um, and apologize for the uh, disjointed, but with the caveat that and when our other speakers arrive, we'll have them speak and then take more questions, although short, they'll give very short presentations by the time they get here. So um, please, uh, uh, I will be happy to open the door to uh, questions from the audience. Um, yes, uh, I think the mic will. Is there, a, um, is there a mic or is there, I thought there was a. Uh, okay. We'll repeat it if, if yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it if you can't. 
I don't think that was directed at me. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, Joanne, what are you going to do about that? Okay. Well, I, I mean, I'm uh, happy to have, I guess, especially given we're missing our two speakers, we could go ahead and shift gears. And um, if the two of you don't mind, we could uh, bring in and have them uh, have uh, Professor Fiffner and Professor Horton. It kind of changes our schedule a little bit. Do you? Yeah. OK. OK. All right. So. Um, it does, and does anyone else? They may not want a beer in the same, you know, photo with us. You got to give them. They still have to maintain their viability in the system. So, uh, but I take and, your point, and and, and, look, and I'm, I, I would imagine that you have a critical perspective. You should feel free to ask it as long yeah, as it's not yeah, in actually, the legal domain. Yeah. We're, uh, Mike and I are. Uh, will we'll take a swing at it. Well, I'm not so great, but yeah, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> So well, let me let me rephrase your question for for Mike. Mike, what is what is the country that is has a more transparent uh, intelligence apparatus with a greater uh, opportunity for public oversight and investigation? What what would you say is the gold what standard the model internationally? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no one's in our zip code. This is the most transparent intelligence structure on the planet. And it puts even the other Western democracies to shame. More so than the British? Oh, God. Um, we, we actually have invasive oversight. All right? OK, so here I go. Um, oh, we were the first ones to break ground to take what had historically been an executive branch function, espionage. The nation's first spy master, George Washington, ran a good spy ring around here during the war, the Revolutionary War. Um, later became president, actually demanded and got a secret budget from the Congress for covert action. Okay? So we have a deep history of espionage in the country and covert action. It has always been considered, among all the Western democracies, a, the province of the executive. In the 1970s, the Americans launched a grand experiment. We were going to expand the oversight of espionage beyond the executive to include the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And so you've got two two select committees in Congress by statute that must be kept fully and currently informed of all significant intelligence activities. And we are the only government on earth that subjects espionage activities to the judicial branch of government. I was doing this talk in Germany after the Angela Merkel accusations, and I mentioned the FISA court and a voice from the darkness in the audience said, that's a really weird court. And I go, because, Yes, it is weird, and I think you think it's weird because it's a secret court. I'm telling you it's a weird because it exists. No other government does this. So okay. let, me add, let me rephrase the question then. Is there a period in U.S. history when there was greater openness? No, and you know, this sounds like you're tossing beach balls at me, and I get to hit them. Um, <laughs> this is why we ask the yeah. tough questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, this is brutal. Um, <laughs> No, and, 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 and here's the punchline, all right? Um, we are as transparent as we've ever been. Transparency has a price when you conduct espionage because there's a reason you do espionage in secret. Now, this, this, we've not yet come to a head, but this, this is a great flow, and it's a point I really wanted to make for the session. So in 2007, I'm director of CIA, and um, I have a civilian advisory board, and we usually keep the names private, but I've gotten the permission of this one individual to give her name. It was Carla Fiorina. And I said, Carly, I want you to take a subcommittee. And uh, I, got a, I got a question. You know, we, we gave the advisory board tough questions, recruiting questions, IT questions. Carly, you, you get the metaphysics. Will America be able to conduct espionage in the future? 
inside of a broader political culture that every day demands more transparency and more public accountability from every aspect of national life. So Carly went and huddled with the other members of the board, talked to folks like yourselves, came back four or five, six months later, said, Mike, we've got a response. I walked across the seventh deck at Langley, sat down in my conference room. Okay, Carly, will America be able to conduct espionage in the future inside a broader political culture that every day demands more transparency and more public accountability from every aspect of national life? And she looked me right in the eye and said, hard to tell. <laughs> Which is a very profound answer. Because I would make the case that espionage is not only compatible with our democracy, it is essential to our democracy. And, and now, now the question becomes, do our demands for transparency cripple our espionage services to the point where they're actually not worth doing? This plays forward to the Snowden revelations. By the way, this is five years in front of Snowden. So Snowden goes out there and um, reveals things, none of which were illegal. And it's, there's no one who makes the claim that any of them were illegal. They were, they were all authorized by the president, legislated by Congress, and overseen by the FISA court. You know, that's, for the purposes of this discussion, that's the Madisonian trifecta. You've got all three branches of government checking off. But in today's political culture, the Snowden revelations created a firestorm. Because in today's political culture, that, that line of secrecy and transparency, of acceptable secrecy and necessary transparency, has shifted. And so we've now, now got a significant portion of our population, and, and a lot of them aren't wearing tinfoil on their heads, a significant portion of our population who are serious people who said, what you got here, you told the president, the, the court knows, the Congress has authorized it, what you got here is, is the consent of the governors. That no longer comprises consent of the governed. Hmm. I get it. You told them, but you didn't tell me. And that's where we are now in this, in this grand national debate. It, Snowden, Snowden is effect. Snowden is not cause. He is flotsam and jetsam on, on this turbulent sea of a broad political cultural change that we as a people are going to have to decide. So you asked about transparency, right? Um, I actually said we have to be more transparent. I, uh, and, and I believe that. Now, you need to know the more transparent your intelligence services are, the less effective they'll be. They're going to be shaving points, all right? just because they're more transparent. That's okay. We would go out for the coin toss and shake hands on it. You're more comfortable. We're a little less effective, but that's the contract that, that you want to have. That, that's, that's perfectly fine. All right? But we do need to have that conversation so that your espionage services have a clear understanding of what it is you want them to do and what it is you will allow them to do. You, but as Peter suggested, your line of departure for this march is an is an intelligence community that is more transparent, probably by exponents, than any other intelligence community in the world. Okay, so I'm, and I'm sensitive to the point that, and I don't want to be seen as uh, suppressing a chance for folks to jump, with, jump up with critical comments. So what I want to do is open to the floor right now, so we can, since they just spoke, I want anyone who has questions right now for our two speakers. Um, and then if, if not, then what I'll do is I will, um, We'll bring up uh, the second panel and uh, get started on the next uh, next presentation. So before we break, though, I'd like to make sure we have any questions for our current speakers. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your insights. So Marcus Siebert from the Goethe University of Frankfurt in Germany, um, and I, I I must say uh, I can agree with 99% uh, of what what you said uh, about German American relationship uh, over the last 10, 15 years. I would say. And um, after the, uh, the heights of the, of the Angela Merkel uh, incidents and stuff like that, I had a chance to speak with the uh, ambassador of the US, uh, United States uh, in Germany and also with the US Gen uh, Consul General. And they said, well, um, if that would happen to us and you would listen to, um, to Obama's cell phone, um, there would be no fuss about it. Uh, so the question is, um, would you concur with that? And would you say there are any limits uh, in the war on terror between friends? So, so does the, the war on terror rectifies everything or justifies everything? No, no, not at all. And, and there, there's, I, I, first of all, I can either confirm or so on and so forth. Okay. Um, <laughs> But that, if that were taking place, that has nothing to do with the war on terror. But the United States and the Federal Republic 
have a lot of intelligence requirements that don't deal with the war on terror, right? And so when I was in Munich for the security conference a year ago, and I actually did this on a late night panel. Uh, so let me just relate to what, what, what I said. Um, when the senator from Illinois was elected president, and we had that period of the interregnum before he took office, we, we noticed that he ran his campaign from his BlackBerry. And so we, uh, we actually approached him and said, you know, uh, you can't do that now. And the president actually responded to us, and he actually said this on CNBC. Actually sounds like a Second Amendment bumper sticker. But what he said was, they're going to have to pry my BlackBerry from my hand. So we figured, all right, he carried Ohio, so, he's, so we're probably going to have to respect his judgment here. So we said, uh, Mr. President, we got it. Can we borrow it for 36 hours? Okay. And we'll, we'll do some tightening of the security. Now, I'm telling the story in a flippant way, but it, frankly, that is what happened. What's the backstory? We're telling the soon-to-be most powerful man in the most powerful nation on Earth that if he used his cell phone in his national capital, his emails, text messages, and phone calls would be monitored by countless foreign intelligence services. And we didn't rend our garments, and we didn't claim more outrage. We just knew that that's the way adult nations treat one another. And so I would totally agree. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be at all concerned. So to summarize... Oh, by the way, I would put it this way. Steal my secrets... Shame on me. To summarize your point, it was really the lawyers, John Bellinger, Matt Waxman, who were responsible for... No, the they, 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 they misled the European community from oh, day one oh, about the United States. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, so um, just... I know the format keeps changing a little bit. And I, I, beg, I beg the patience of uh, Professor Piffner and Professor Horton uh, for a few minutes um, to allow uh, just a... a hopefully maybe a slightly abbreviated um, uh, opening remarks. And we've already launched into a bit of a discussion here already, but I, I wanted to make sure we get our other honored guest speakers. And so first hear from uh, Matt Waxman. I know he just... Well, I think John's going to go first, or, right? Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, Matt. Again. Yeah. Yeah, uh, John. Uh, and uh, and I, unfortunately, as you know, we're a little beyond our time, but we still have, begging the patience, we will have plenty of time for... More, a few more questions from the audience and from also from our other panelists. So thank you. Great. So John. Sir, I am so sorry we're late. Can't you guys do anything about the traffic out here? <laughs> uh, there we are. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, it's good to be together with uh, other colleagues. Let me just dive right in. So I think, although I wasn't here for my introduction, I think you probably know I was the legal advisor for the State Department in the second term and the legal advisor for the National Security Council in the first term, which basically means that I was Condoleezza Rice's lawyer for all eight years. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about more narrowly about international law and the Bush administration's approach to international law. Um, you probably at the 50,000 foot level, you know, think, uh, you know, as many people do, you know, that the Bush administration didn't believe in international law, uh, didn't take it seriously. Uh, a lot of this is focused on sort of two uh, uh, sets of actions from the first term, uh, the Iraq war, uh, and then uh, certain decisions with respect to detainees in the first term. Uh, and so, you know, that has come to color the Bush administration, but really doesn't take into account, frankly, the full eight years, uh, including the administration's approach on a lot of other international law issues, and particularly uh, in the second term. I don't know how many, if, B, if Peter Baker has already spoken. Is Peter here? Yeah, so if you all have read Peter's book, I think you see you know, a lot of the course corrections uh, on a lot of issues that took place in the second term, uh, particularly when Secretary Rice was Secretary of State. But I want to just very briefly cover a couple of things uh, you know, one, treaties, two, the approach to international uh, uh, courts and tribunals, particularly the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, uh, and really leave you with a couple of facts that may surprise you. One, treaties. Uh, in the eight years of the Bush administration, uh, we got 163 treaties through the Senate. That's more new international law than at any point in American history. In the last two years of the administration, when I was legal advisor, we got 90 treaties through the Senate. That's more new treaties through the Senate than in any two-year term in history. Now, 
these the, this is, these are multilateral treaties, bilateral treaties, uh, human rights treaties, law of war treaties, environmental treaties, a whole variety of things. So that is a lot of new international law. Now, the Senate was not doing this on its own. The Senate, the treaties have to be sent by the president to the Senate. So President Bush literally had to sign every single treaty transmittal package to the Senate. And then we worked very hard to get these treaties through the Senate. I personally testified in favor uh, of a number of them. So you know, for people who say, well, this is an administration that didn't believe in international law, this administration put more new international law. You cannot dispute that. This is more new international law in treaty form than in any eight-year president. Uh, the Obama administration, in contrast, in six years, has had 13 treaties through the Senate. Now, admittedly, they have been facing a very difficult Senate in the last couple of years. Uh, but remember, the first two years of their term, uh, they had a Democratic majority. They actually could have gotten a number of treaties through had they focused on it. And my point here simply is, you know, this, is, this record is perhaps you know, more mixed than, than, than people would be aware. Let me turn quickly now to uh, uh, international tribunals uh, and the International Court of Justice. Now, this is something that probably, you know, a general audience may know less about, but President Bush made what may be the most difficult decision ever made by a president to comply with a ruling of the International Court of Justice uh, and to comply with one of its rulings. Uh, early in our second term, when I became legal advisor and Secretary of State was, uh, Secretary Rice was Secretary of State, the International Court of Justice, this is not the International Criminal Court, but the International Court of Justice had uh, ruled that the United States uh, had to uh, review the death sentences of 51 Mexican nationals on, in, on death row in different states. Uh, because they had not been given their consular notice, the right to access to a Mexican consular official. The problem was they had all uh, uh, exhausted their state law remedies. So President Bush was confronted with a difficult decision. Did he comply with a ruling of a court in The Hague telling him to review the death sentences of 51 Mexican nationals all of whom had exhausted their appeals, the majority of which were in his home state of Texas. So did he follow the UN Charter and international law over the strong objections of his home state? The, I can tell you the citizens of Texas were not writing to the president to say, please listen to this court in The Hague, quite the reverse. Yeah. So I don't know who was more surprised when the president in February 2005 uh, issued an order telling the states, including his home state of Texas, that they had to review all of these death sentences. Now, for those of you who actually know this story, Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, and a man who's now familiar to many of you, Ted Cruz, who was the Solicitor General of Texas, promptly sued the president. They sued the former governor, the president of the United States, to say, you can't do this to us. We are Texas, and you can't tell us what to do even if you are trying to comply with international law. Uh, we then defended the president's decision all the way up to the Supreme Court, uh, and unfortunately, and surprisingly, and in my view, wrongly, uh, we lost. The Supreme Court said uh, unanimously that there is an international law obligation to comply with the International Court of Justice's rulings, uh, and we respect the president for trying to comply, but under the Constitution, he lacks the power to tell the states what to do to supersede their rights. So the lesson here is, in an, perhaps the most difficult decision to comply, and when incredibly politically unpopular, uh, the president made a decision to comply uh, with the ruling of the often much disliked International Court of Justice. Then very briefly, uh, much in the news these days, the International Criminal Court the other big tribunal in The Hague. Uh, in the first term, uh, though, uh, let me say, the Bush administration's approach to the International Criminal Court by many is, is uh, uh, viewed through the lens of, again, what happened in the first term, 
when the, uh, the United States uh, famously told the UN Secretary General that the US was not going to become party to the International Criminal Court. This became famously known as the unsigning of the Rome Statute, and it got Europeans and much of the rest of the world very mad at us. Uh, they thought the Bush administration was out to try to kill the International Criminal Court. Now, interestingly, they'd forgotten a little bit of their history, uh, because for those of you who know this, the Clinton administration, which had negotiated the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court, had actually voted against the Rome Statute. The United States and the Clinton administration was one of only seven countries in the world to vote against the Rome Statute. At the end of the day, President Clinton finally made the decision, even though he voted against the treaty creating the International Criminal Court, to sign the treaty. But then he, in his signing statement, said uh, that uh, the treaty was so flawed that he would not send it to the Senate unless it uh, was fixed. So President Bush really just formalized that by saying, we don't, begin, we don't intend to become party. But we realized after the first term there was so much misunderstanding of what the US had done that, that somehow the Bush administration was out to try to kill the International Criminal Court, which is really not true, uh, uh, that we course corrected in the second term. And this is, this is really consistent, particularly uh, speaking to the scholars in the audience here and consistent with Peter Baker's book, with you know, a lot of course correction that took place in the second term. In the second term, we took a much more pragmatic uh, approach to the International Criminal Court, working with it when it was appropriate. 10 years ago, on this coming Monday, on March 31st, 2005, uh, one of Secretary Rice's and my, my first decisions, uh, uh, approved by the President, the United States agreed to refer Sudan and the genocide in Sudan to the International Criminal Court by agreeing to UN Security Council Resolution 1593. And again, much of the world was surprised because they thought, well, wow, we, we thought the Bush administration hated the International Criminal Court. Um, well, it turned out that President Bush was more concerned about the genocide in Darfur than he was about the International Criminal Court. And so we agreed to do that. And for the next four years, really took a pragmatic, constructive approach to the International Criminal Court uh, that the Obama administration uh, has largely built on. And I can tell you, I, I, I hear pretty regularly uh, from friends in the Obama administration when they are criticized by conservatives for uh, continuing a, uh, a, uh, to support the International Criminal Court on certain issues, their defense is basically to say, well, we're just continuing the approach that was taken in the second term of the Bush administration, which again, I think is probably a theme that many of you all have been hearing over the last couple of days, which is that because of course corrections taken on so many issues in the second term of the Bush administration, that there resulted in pretty much continuity uh, between the second term of the Bush administration uh, and the first term of the Obama administration on a number of foreign policy issues. Uh, I'm going to just say one more thing, and this will probably bleed in into what Matt's going to say. You know, finally, on some of the detention issues, which I assume you all probably talked about, um, you know, we also realized uh, that from the after the first term that we needed to have a course correction uh, on a whole variety of different uh, detainee issues. Secretary Rice felt about very strongly about this. She writes about this in her memoirs. Uh, Matt, who was the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the, uh, for Detainee Affairs uh, at the Defense Department, and I worked very closely together uh, to try to empty out Guantanamo as best we could. We got 550 people out of Guantanamo. Uh, we uh, worked together. Secretary Rice worked to close down the, uh, uh, the, the CIA facilities uh, uh, in 2006. Uh, reforms were made uh, to detainee policies and to military commissions. I began uh, a, a very extensive dialogue with our uh, European and other allies all around the world, regularly meeting with them uh, to discuss the law that was applicable uh, to a conflict with Al Qaeda. Uh, and frankly, most of those laws and policies have then continued on. If you look at, frankly, the speeches that I gave on uh, detention law and the armed conflict that we are in 
uh, with Al Qaeda uh, uh, in, that I gave between 2005 and 2009, you will see very little difference between the things uh, that uh, Eric Holder uh, and others have been saying about the law applicable uh, to the conflict between the United States and Al Qaeda uh, during the Obama administration. So again, worked very hard uh, to try to course correct on these detainee issues. So uh, I'll stop there. Okay, and uh, again, apologies for the, we're running a little over, but if you, Matt, if you could, Matt was, uh, uh, Professor Waxman was, uh, the, as uh, John mentioned, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Detainee Affairs, and also served uh, with the National Security Council and at the State Department during the time of the Bush administration. Professor Waxman? Great, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me here. I'll, I'll also uh, just try to be brief. I, I, let me make a couple of general points about the claims one often hears about uh, uh, the Bush administration or President Bush and international law, and then talk about a, a few issues that may or may not have been touched on already. I, 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 let, let me begin with a few broad observations uh, that I learned from six or seven years in the administration. One is, uh, I, as has been referenced already, many policies and, and especially legal interpretations on important international law issues evolved over time. They were not, uh, they were not static. The second is no administration is truly unitary, and like any administration, there were uh, uh, internal debates, internal divides, some of which were never resolved, or some of which uh, 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 shifted in the sort of the balance of, of influence uh, uh, as, as, as time went on during the administration. Uh, uh, finally, uh, I never found that uh, uh, President Bush himself was ideologically committed to any extreme view when it came to international law. I, I found him to be often actually much more pragmatic um, than, 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 many, uh, uh, than, than many other uh, top officials in the administration, in fact. Uh, but let me go back uh, uh, to the very beginning of the administration. I came in at a, an interesting time. I started in the front office of the National Security Council uh, a little bit before 9-11. Um, I, and I, I would say that at that time, in the spring, summer, fall of 2001, uh, the biggest international law issues on the plate of the National Security Council were, uh, number, number one, I, I think probably the one that occupied the most time and energy of the international lawyers there were uh, bilateral strategic issues, strategic nuclear issues between the United States and Russia. Uh, there were important treaty issues, including the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, uh, 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 an effort to uh, sculpt a new nuclear reduction treaty with, with Russia. There were big policy controversies about withdrawing from the ABM Treaty, but I don't think there was anything all that uh, 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 legally controversial in that the ABM Treaty had a withdrawal provision that the uh, Bush administration, as a policy matter, decided to invoke. Uh, uh, the second issue was withdrawing from or, or, or issuing the Kyoto Protocol and the ICC. I'll, I'll turn to, uh, back to that in a moment. The third, though, was an ambitious uh, 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 international trade agenda premised on new international trade agreements. Now, uh, Kyoto and uh, the ICC, as John uh, often referred to, are often cited for the proposition that uh, uh, Bush and the Bush administration were hostile to international law, including especially uh, uh, big global treaties, I think that view is exaggerated for a couple of reasons. Um, first, on both of those issues, I, I do think the Bush administration made um, some big tactical errors in the way, in, 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 in its diplomacy with regard to um, Kyoto and the ICC. Uh, I, I think the way that especially the United States engaged or failed to engage with its closest allies and partners on both of those issues was a mistake that was difficult to recover from. It's also, though, important to, uh, I, I think, recognize um, where domestic politics were generally on, uh, on climate and on the International Criminal Court. Uh, 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 Congress at that time was more hostile than the Bush administration to the International Criminal Court uh, and uh, 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 passed something called the American Service Members Protection Act that uh, 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 basically through statute uh, uh, adopted a position hostile to cooperation with the ICC. And with regard to Kyoto, we've seen, uh, 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 it, it, the Obama administration has, ha has seen 
uh, that Congress is not willing to support the kind of binding numerical targets uh, that were contemplated under a, a Kyoto regime. Uh, I, 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 uh, the, the, the last point is, is, is one I, I won't repeat, which is that in, on both of those issues, on climate and on international criminal justice, as John has already said, there was a significant evolution in, in the Bush administration's policy over the course of those eight years. Now, with regard to uh, the global war on terror issues, I think that's already been, been covered. Uh, I'll just mention, uh, because I think it's important for a, a conference like this, that on an issue like uh, 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 detainee treatment standards uh, uh, and what was driving the uh, uh, evolution in the US approach, I think all three branches of government had an important role to play, and that's one of the things that makes detainee treatment uh, uh, an interesting case study uh, for this evolution in, in interpretive approach. Uh, the Supreme Court played an important role in, uh, I, 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 in, in cases like Hamdan. Uh, the Congress played an important role in actions like the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, uh, uh, the Military Commissions Act, and the executive branch played an important role through its own internal process of review and reconsideration of certain decisions and, and issues. Let me conclude um, with a word about another uh, uh, international legal controversy often associated with uh, the Bush presidency and especially the Iraq war, which is the preemption doctrine. Uh, I, 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 in my view, the, the, the story on the preemption doctrine is not finished. Uh, I, 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 the preemption doctrine was uh, articulated uh, in the 2002 White House National Security Strategy document. And in brief, what it said is that uh, the traditional doctrine of anticipatory self-defense, whereby a state can uh, uh, respond uh, with, it, with, with military force, not just against an attack that has taken place, but also uh, the threat of an imminent attack, um, that in a world of uh, uh, proliferating weapons of mass destruction, especially nuclear weapons among rogue states and perhaps among terrorist organizations, it may be necessary to have a more expansive or flexible understanding of, uh, of what imminent threat means. Uh, I, I, now, it's, it's ironic uh, that the preemption doctrine, or ironic in some ways that the preemption doctrine, that idea is associated with the Iraq war and negatively associated with the, the Iraq war um, because that was not actually the legal argument. That was not actually the legal justification that the Bush administration and its allies relied on for the 2002, uh, sorry, sorry, the 2003 Iraq war. It was actually uh, uh, premised legally on uh, uh, existing UN Security Council resolutions. A controversial interpretation, but that was, that was the argument. It was one that the United States, Britain, and other allies uh, uh, relied on. Uh, uh, with regard to the preemption doctrine, though, I, I do think the Bush administration, uh, again, made a, 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 an, an important tactical error in the way that it spoke about preemption. I think this was poorly rolled out I think it was talked about uh, and, and uh, uh, presented diplomatically poorly and as, as, as a much more radical shift in US interpretation of international law than was really merited. Uh, uh, and like I said, uh, 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 in that regard, this debate is not over. Uh, we see very similar types of arguments if, uh, uh, to the preemption doctrine articulation in the way the Obama administration, for example, talks about drone strikes and the way the Obama administration, like the Bush administration, thought about what it means for a, a terrorist suspect to be engaged in imminent threats against the United States, taking a more flexible, expansive approach to this idea of the imminence of threats that would justify armed force. Some of our allies in Europe and elsewhere have also uh, 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 taken note of this need to think more flexibly in a world of terrorist threats, weapons of mass destruction threats, to think more flexibly about how we think about imminence and, and just how immediate a threat must be before a state is entitled to take action in self-defense. Uh, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, no U.S. president in the post-9-11 environment 
I, I would, would reject uh, I, uh, the preemption doctrine. And I think it's actually, unfortunately, just a matter of time before we see uh, uh, future presidents having to rely uh, very explicitly on it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, John and Matt. I really appreciate uh, you jumping in. And I, um, I think that in the interest of time, I'll only be able to take one question, and then we'll turn it over to the next panel. Uh, let's see. Or maybe two. Start with this, maybe two questions. <laughs> yes, go ahead. And the speakers, of course, uh, can ask questions right now, or we'll have them up in the minute. Thanks. Uh, this question is uh, for Michael Hayden. I was just curious. Uh, the way it seems that uh, the, some people may look at it is that the security techniques that we use have prevented terrorist attacks and have made this country more safe. I'm curious as to is there any way to actually measure whether these techniques are effective, whether it's the torture or surveillance or any of those types of techniques, are, is there a way for you, for the CIA or NSA to measure that it's effective? Well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, and I know the following speakers may, may describe it differently, I, I wouldn't describe this torture. Um, beyond that, uh, one measure of effectiveness is the lack of attacks on the American homeland from abroad since September 11, 2001. Um, Another would be the CIA rebuttal to the Senate Democratic Report on the CIA detention program, in which, in, in great detail, it points out how these information gained from these detainees is absolutely critical in preempting attacks. Actually, actually, an important thread, not the only thread, but an important thread in getting Navy SEALs to Abbottabad. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think, broadly speaking, American intelligence has been quite successful. Number one, detecting attacks. And number two, and it's probably more important than playing in the goal mouth and stopping penalty kicks. Uh, it's kicking the ball down the field, going into the other fellow's zone and attempting to score goals on him. But by that I mean, we take the fight to the enemy. The uh, eight bin Laden documents that were released in the court process going down in uh, Manhattan now, are remarkable documents. You can, you can actually download them. They're very long, half an Arabic, English translation. But look at the parts of the document that describe Al-Qaeda's response to the targeted killing program of the United States. And it, 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 it is deeply emotional commentary in letters to and from bin Laden as to how destructive to Al-Qaeda prime the, these attacks were. Um. Okay, I, oops, I don't want to cut you off, so maybe I'll take one more question. Um, directed, directed at these two. Directed at the, yeah, a question for, um, yes, sir, gentleman here. Okay. Since so many treaties were passed or approved during the first, during the first administration, what ever happened to the law of the sea treaty and have we compromised our national security by not ratifying the treaty? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, uh, this was one uh, actually one of the great disappointments, but it actually gets to an interesting point. So I'm glad you, we did. We had, the Bush administration came into office thinking initially maybe we were not going to like the law of the sea treaty. You know, conservative Republicans, including you know Don Rumsfeld, had been involved back in the Reagan administration in trying to scuttle the uh, law of the sea treaty. Uh, when the administration came in and reviewed treaties that were still pending before the Senate, the initial thought was, oh, you know, Ronald Reagan didn't like this treaty. Conservative Republicans are against this. We're not going to like it. I actually led, when I was the NSC legal advisor, the interagency review. We had a year-long review and concluded that the treaty had been fixed, uh, that, in fact, Ronald Reagan had succeeded. Uh, you know, you can, if you want, disagree with his tactics, but the fact was, the problems that the Reagan administration had identified were then fixed during the Clinton administration. Uh, our other industrial allies, Japan, Germany, the UK, and others became party. Uh, we then reviewed it in the Bush administration, and lo and behold, it was a little bit like complying with the ICJ order. I'm not sure who was more surprised, you know, uh, liberals or conservatives, but President Bush came out and said, I'm in favor of the law of the sea treaty, and we sent it to the Senate and said that the Senate should act rapidly on it. Uh, administration officials, including me, uh, uh, testified in favor of the treaty twice in 2004 and 2007. It was approved by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. 
uh, based on the recommendation of the administration and sadly was never brought uh, to a floor vote. Uh, again, I think the Obama administration probably had the votes in 2009. One of my lessons of all of this is do not try to get difficult multilateral treaties through the Senate in an election year. You know, that is what happened when the Obama administration tried to push through the UN Disabilities Convention in a lame duck session. Uh, you know, these things are just too difficult uh, and, you know, you need to do them in off years. Uh, and uh, I think, frankly, the Law of the Sea Treaty could have gotten through the Senate in 2009. Uh, Senator Kerry had a very good set of hearings in 2012. I actually went and testified as a Republican official uh, before Senator Kerry asked me to come up and explain why the Bush administration had favored the Law of the Sea Treaty. And I did. Interestingly, I sat right next to Don Rumsfeld, who was testifying against the Law of the Sea Treaty, <laughs> while I testified, along with John Negroponte, in favor of the Law of the Sea Treaty, explaining why the Bush administration had favored it. Uh, and urged approval. Again, though, trying to do that in an election year, uh, that was actually in the summer of 2012, literally while Senator Kerry was having a very good set of hearings, uh, a group of Republicans was visit, busily collecting letter or, or signatures so that by the end of the hearings, literally, there were something like 34 signatures against the treaty. Um, to answer your final question, we, we really should be party to the Law of the Sea Treaty. It is very much in our uh, national security, military, uh, uh, economic, and environmental interest. It's very unfortunate that we're not a party to it. Um, I see no chance that the Obama administration will be able to get it through this Senate over the next couple of years, and hopefully in, you know, somewhere down the pike we will be able to revisit the issue, similarly with the UN Disabilities Convention. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I, I'm going to just jump right into this, and I, I do apologize again for the, uh, actually we haven't changed our format, but we have changed our time allocation. Um, we're going to hear today from folks from outside the administration who obviously have very interesting and important views on uh, the subject we just talked about here. We'll start, I, I believe we agree, we'll start with Professor James Kiffner uh, from University Professor School of Public Policy at George Mason University in Virginia, Professor Fifner is a scholar of the presidency, American national government, and public management. Um, and uh, he's gonna focus his remarks on the intersection of US law related to foreign affairs and presidential decision making. And then I'll introduce uh, Professor Scott Horton uh, when we get to him. So if you don't mind, go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do is step back a little bit for, for some perspective uh, and step back about 800 years uh, to Magna Carta 1215, 800 years ago. Uh, when King John uh, put a seal on Ad Magna Carta, which is the bedrock of Anglo-American jurisprudence. Uh, and just to quote one clause, uh, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his equal or by the law of the land. Okay, so that's pretty bare bones. But from that grew over the last eight centuries uh, uh, the, the ideas of limited executive power, limited government, individual rights, and due process of, of law. And bloody wars have been fought about this uh, over the last uh, uh, eight centuries, including the American Revolution. <clears throat> the framers of the US Constitution accepted a lot of the fundamental individual rights established uh, in England, but they rejected monarchical government uh, and created a separation of power system. And I think that that's an important uh, backdrop here when we consider a lot of the issues of the Bush and Obama administrations. Now, I think executives uh, rightly want to protect 
the United States executives all over want to do what their job is, uh, provide security and, and so forth. Uh, and the question is, should there be any check on what executives think that they ought to do or, or is necessary? I think the framers of the Constitution said, yes, there are some limits. One of them is public law, and one of, it, one of them is a separation of powers uh, system. So in, in, I'd like to mention in the, the Bush administration, there's several precedents that I think uh, uh, that set, uh, push the uh, boundaries of executive power a bit. Uh, coercive interrogation, uh, habeas corpus, uh, national uh, NSA surveillance of Americans, and the use of signing statements. I'll say a little bit about each one of these, uh, but this is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, I think President Obama has accepted some of these, as I'll mention, and pushed further uh, in others. So I think executive assertion of power is not, uh, not partisan, it's not Republican, it's not Democratic. It has to do with separation of, of powers. Uh, coercive interrogation. Uh, basically, President Bush suspended the Geneva Conventions on February 7th of 2002, uh, ignoring several U.S. laws uh, in, in the process, customary international law. Uh, the U-Bybee memos uh, said that uh, in Article uh, Section 5, uh, that uh, the executive power could overcome any law passed by Congress. Very uh, strong assertion of, of executive, uh, inherent executive power. And they also ignored uh, common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, and this is not the POW section. This is an article common uh, to all sections saying that uh, uh, nobody, is to be, nobody under the control of the signatory uh, is to be tortured or treated with uh, cruel, inhuman, or degrading uh, treatment. Okay, one issue. Uh, habeas corpus, an another one, uh, goes back again to, to Magna Carta and the Habeas Corpus Acts of 1648 and 1679 uh, in England. The framers put this in Article 1, Section 9, before the uh, Bill of Rights was even considered part of the Constitution. It limits executive power, put somebody in jail, uh, and if somebody applies for a writ, uh, you, they ha you have to go, the, the executive has to go to the court uh, and make an argument that there's a reasonable cause that this person did commit the crime. There's a law, uh, uh, and they violated it. So it's not a get out of jail free card. Uh, what it is is an external look, a judge of a different uh, branch of government taking a look at it and saying, that's reasonable, or no, it's not reasonable. You have to let the person go free. Uh, the, the Bush administration, tried to strip the courts of jurisdiction uh, in habeas corpus uh, uh, in the Military Commissions Act. Uh, that was reversed in the Supreme Court, the Bomedian decision. Uh, so interestingly, reversing both uh, Congress and the executive, uh, that this is a bedrock of, uh, of American uh, freedoms. <coughs> Warrantless uh, NSA surveillance of, of Americans. Now, of course, executives want to protect uh, the country. There, there's no doubt about it. That's their duty. Uh, it, but the framers considered this, uh, and they wrote the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and papers. Uh, warrants shall be issued uh, part only uh, particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be se seized. Now, was this a problem in the United States ever? Well, yes, you only have to go back to 1975 and the church committee uh, hearings, which uh, exposed uh, abuse of surveillance for domestic purposes of presidents from FDR uh, through Richard Nixon. This was a problem. Both parties were doing it, and, and it, the argument was we were protecting Americans uh, and so forth. The NSA, CIA, FBI, the Army compiled dossiers on hundreds of thousands of I I innocent Americans, uh, and, and that was uh, abuse. So the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Act was passed which is supposed to be the exclusive means by which uh, national security surveillance of Americans uh, could take place. Uh, president, uh, the president's surveillance program that President Bush uh, established uh, ignored that uh, and ignored uh, FISA uh, during, during that period. Uh, some of the uh, surveillance may have been reasonable. The parts of it, though, were, uh, were very uh, questionable. And, and I would say insofar as NSA sweeps up uh, information on persons in the United States that don't have, uh, about whom there's no suspicion. Um, it's dangerous in the future. All you have to do is look at the Church Commission uh, abuses, and there are internal checks, certainly, and I'm not saying that the, the, either the Bush or Obama administration has abused this, uh, but the problem is in the future there may be abuses. Just to go, I uh, encourage you to look at the uh, Church Committee reports. Signing statements. When signing a bill into law, uh, presidents can make statements, they can say all sorts of good things, but one of the, when they make a constitutional signing statement, uh, they point out a particular part in the law that they say they do not feel bound by. 
uh, the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, one famous example, President Bush said that he didn't feel com uh, that uh, compelled to comply with all of it because it interfered with his e executive power. And of course, there's many other uh, uh, e examples of this. Uh, and in a sense, this is uh, a direct threat uh, to the rule of law. Uh, Article 1 says all legislative powers here and granted uh, go to Congress. Uh, and the president, by using the si these signing statements, can uh, in effect, uh, uh, if, if effect a veto without submitting it uh, to Congress for a potential override. Uh, Kings of England uh, had the, sort, uh, the power to suspend the law. Uh, part that was taken away uh, centuries ago. The framers of the Constitution did not give the president the power to suspend the law. Uh, and, you know, a number of presidents have done this uh, in the last half century, uh, but President Bush uh, issued more than twice as many constitutional objections uh, as all other presidents uh, combined, about 1,200 of them. Uh, and the main problem here is the president may say, I, I don't feel bound uh, to carry out, to faithfully carry out uh, the law, can affect a, 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 an item veto. The problem with this is, is in a separation of power system, uh, there's no remedy of this because sometimes Congress does pass a law that impinges on the president's. So it's very difficult to uh, formulate any kind of law that would nullify that. Um, and, and with respect to continuity of, of, of uh, executives, I, I think that uh, the previous panel was, was right on that. There's a lot of continuity here. Uh, President Obama uh, did break in terms of uh, coercive interrogation as a matter of policy. Uh, he said uh, no more of, of that. Uh, with habeas corpus, uh, there's about 240 prisoners uh, left in, in Guantanamo. Uh, President, uh, they did a study. Most of them could, could be set free. Uh, about 33 could be tried in courts for crimes. Uh, but 35 had to be held indefinitely uh, because they're dangerous and because evidence against them had been tainted by uh, torture. Uh, which, so this amounts to an indefinite uh, imprisonment, uh, which is antithetical to constitutional guarantees of due process. Uh, on the other hand, there's no clear solution. Uh, to, to this problem. It's, it's a real uh, problem. Uh, uh, President Obama, uh, on NSA, uh, the, the Patriot Act uh, and FISA had been uh, amended by that time, and so Congress made uh, legal what was previous, uh, Ill, previously illegal when President Bush did it. Uh, President Obama sort of uh, criticized uh, President Bush, but he did, hasn't done anything uh, on his own to back off of those things, uh, and so he, uh, he basically is, is using those uh, those powers, which because he's an executive and he doesn't want another 9-11 on his watch, as all presidents uh, will feel. Uh, on signing statements, uh, Senator Obama denounced uh, President Bush uh, on the constitutional signing statements, uh, didn't issue near, nearly as many, but did issue some, about 30 or so, and some of them are, are constitutional. Um, uh, it, that, uh, so this is something that presidents uh, are going to do, and as I said, that, that there's no solution. Okay, in addition, uh, though uh, President Obama has made other inroads in terms of executive power, just to, to, to list a number, um, uh, targeted killings, the broad use of, of uh, drones with a very broad legal justification uh, for doing that, uh, stretching the t 2001 AUMF to cover ISIS, uh, Syria, and, and so forth. Um, he asserted recess appointments in a very aggressive way, the Supreme Court uh, reversed him uh, rightly on that, I think. Um, he's pushed executive privilege uh, lower than the White House into the executive branch. He's pushed the immigration implementation, you know, margin or a, a bit further, uh, at least questionable. The state secrets pledge he's used uh, uh, as certainly as, as the Bush administration had. Uh, so, uh, and uh, so the framers would expect this, uh, and it's not as if Congress uh, or judges are wiser or better than executives. The point of the framers is that there has to be some sort of, of check. Uh, they were right, uh, I, I think. Uh, and I think part of the problem here is, is Congress, who is, which has abdicated uh, it, its role. And I think, you know, between the president and, and Congress, this swinging pendulum, I think it's less of a pendulum and, and more of a ratchet in terms of towards the executive. Once they set a precedent, New presidents can point back to this and say, well, the president of the other party did it, so that therefore I can do it. And I think that this is something that we have to, uh, we have to worry about, we have to think about. Um, uh, executives will continue to press uh, the limits. Uh, and I don't doubt any of the problems that raised by uh, General Hayden about threats to the United States. On the other hand, there's got to be some limit, and the question is where that limit should be. And I think it's important for us to, to think about that uh, and, and try to draw lines uh, where, where we can. Uh, so I'm concerned 
with the precedents that were set in the Bush administration, but also in the Obama administration. And the problem I see is that future presidents can use them uh, to press executive uh, power even further. Uh, and as James, met, closing with James Madison, Federalist 51, uh, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Um, now, just quickly, I'll, we'll hear from, uh, I'm not quickly, I'll quickly introduce Professor Scott Horton. It'll be you can quick, take as much worry. time as you wish. Um, Professor Scott Horton, who is currently an adjunct professor of law at Columbia University. Professor Horton is a little unusual from the legal perspective. He's had a dual career in the, in the field of private business law as a partner in a major New York City law firm, but also as a human rights activist and advocate. And he's uh, done a lot of work for the New York City Bar Association on human rights abuses in the conduct of the war on terrorism. So um, he's uh, lots of different affiliations. He's a legal affairs contributor to Harper's Magazine, um, and I think he has a radio show as well. That's actually not me. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Someone and else with the name yes, Scott Horton. Okay, Horton. another Scott Horton. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, but he is the he is the one who is legal affairs and contributor to Harper's Magazine. So, um, anyways, uh, please, uh, Professor Horton, please go ahead. Thank you, Julian. Um, so uh, I, I'll talk about. Uh, the international law legacy or major issues that arose under international law during the Bush administration. I'm going to focus in on uh, laws of armed conflict um, or international humanitarian law as an area where I think there have been fairly uh, profound changes, perhaps a profound influence uh, in the way this law has evolved going forward. Um, and I think it's uh, not to say that this is the only area we should cover in the prior panel. Of course, we heard about the law at sea and many other areas. Um, but I think it's a particularly important part of the edifice of international law. It's part of the absolute bedrock of international law, uh, one of the oldest parts of that law, uh, a part of the law that has the broadest uh, international um, uh, subscription, certainly if we look at things like the, uh, the Hague Conventions uh, on uh, International Warfare and we look at the Geneva Conventions and their uh, various uh, uh, iterations, there, it seems we can make the argument that there's no body of law that's as broadly uh, observed or subscribed to. Um, and going into the Bush administration, I think we had some pretty clear notions that there was, a, there was a set of legal rules that applied to armed conflict, uh, and indeed the United States had played uh, a, uh, a key role in writing those rules, going back to the Libra Code during the American Civil War and going forward uh, to the Geneva Conventions themselves. Um, and uh, that, uh, that these rules included the definition of war in terms of time and place. It covered a certain territory, it covered a, uh, a certain uh, period of time from the commencement to the conclusion of hostilities. Uh, and outside of that, generally, uh, there was a different legal regime that applied. So it uh, provided a basis for a paradigm shift in terms of law, but it was controlled. And these rules historically also had had a relationship with terrorism as a problem for the state, um, at least to the extent that terrorism involves non-state actors. So radical groups, and, and I think, by the way, of course, it's regularly claimed that the terrorism problem is a problem that arrived uh, on 9-11, but that's nonsense, of course. The terrorism problem has been around uh, forever, and in fact, if you go back to uh, the United States at the beginning of the last century, or Europe about the same time, you see huge problems with anarchist terrorists and other terrorist groups. It's been with us. It's calling them waves in and out, but it's been with us for a long time, and it's been addressed by our legal systems for a long time. Frequently, these radical groups would attempt to adopt state forms and nomenclature. They might organize quasi-military organizations to implement their, their plans. They might aspire to control of territory and population. They might proclaim a political agenda. They might demand the right to be treated under the laws of war. Um, and uh, that would arguably uh, accord a privilege to some of their, uh, of their acts, uh, some of their violent acts. However, states uh, up until 9-11, I think, pretty generally firmly rejected these pretenses and insisted that the groups be dealt with under criminal law. Uh, and a good example of that, uh, what I'll call the, the Thatcher Doctrine, following uh, Margaret Thatcher. So if you recall, during uh, her term, uh, of office, uh, the UK was dealing with the troubles in Northern Ireland, uh, Sinn Féin, the Irish Republican Army, several other smaller groups, 
Uh, they argued uh, that they were engaged in terrorist activities that included bombings in major population centers um, in Britain, um, specifically in England, in fact. Um, uh, they argued uh, that these were military operations, that they were designed to secure the reintegration of the six counties of Ulster, um, remaining under British control into the Irish state. They insisted uh, that their soldiers, and yes, they called them soldiers, and they gave them uh, uh, badges and, and, and ranks, uh, were entitled to be treated as prisoners of war, that they were entitled to rights and privileges laid out in the Geneva Conventions and so forth. And Margaret Thatcher very firmly rejected this perspective, insisted the IRA had to be treated as an organized criminal group, uh, and her administration then introduced a series of special measures that were designed to address terrorist activities uh, within the um, rubric of criminal justice administration. There was a streamlined criminal justice uh, procedure, in fact, that eliminated certain established rights uh, up until that point, like the right of confrontation, for instance, to diplomatic courts. Uh, but I think the, the, the Thatcher paradigm was the one that was broadly accepted around the world up until 9-11. The Bush administration decided very early after 9-11 uh, that it would depart pretty radically from this paradigm. It rejected the criminal justice approach as inherently weak and ill-suited to address operations targeting uh, terrorist groups led by al-Qaeda, and it proposed instead that military rubrics be used. But this led to precisely the challenge that Margaret Thatcher had sought to avoid, that is the international humanitarian law system of prisoner protections, which in many ways was far more robust than what was found in even some of the more aggressive civil rights regimes and, and criminal justice systems in Western democracies, because it systematically avoided stigma attached to incarceration. Um, the Bush team then sought to establish a state of exception, arguing that while laws of armed conflict applied to some extent, the terrorists were not entitled to any of the protections afforded lawful combatants under the law. They fell into an unprotected category, a sort of gap in the international humanitarian law system. And I think a great deal of effort was uh, fed into trying to identify these interstices, these gaps, uh, and expand them uh, with the obvious uh, uh, intention of uh, avoiding legally restrictive regimes and creating a space in which the executive could exercise unfettered discretion and how it would uh, treat these prisoners. So this led to a series of international law controversies arising from their attempts to hammer laws of armed conflict into something better suited to, uh, uh, to serve the needs of what they described as a global war on terror. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to stop and identify at the starting point the paradigm shift itself as the key, the most fundamental problem. In fact, I think General Hayden and his remarks uh, in the last panel uh, also made that point. I mean, it was a fundamental point of departure, fundamental point of distinction, uh, and created the controversy that we still see with us today. And today we see it in the debate that goes on uh, in Congress today, for instance, over the authorization for the use of military force, where we see a uh, we see Republicans generally arguing. Uh, for much broader uh, definitions of, of war that have uh, less, uh, uh, less finesse in terms of defined enemies, space, and time. The Democrats arguing in favor of tighter parameters uh, being put on the war. All of that goes to this paradigm shift. Um, in fact, there's a recent piece that Rosa Brooks has, has written in Foreign Policy uh, in which she makes the point that this is you know, one of the huge changes that's come about, and she, and she says it looks like um, uh, the, the American uh, academic community, scholarly community, has just given up the ghost on this issue, just accepts it. Um, I'm not quite sure that that's true. In fact, you know, there were a number of uh, quickly penned responses to her uh, piece arguing the other way. But I think if we look outside the United States, and again, this goes back to one of the points that General Hayden made, uh, that we see very little acceptance of this perspective and this viewpoint 
outside the United States. To be sure, there are a couple of countries that have uh, taken the U.S. approach. There are a number of countries that will accept, the arg accept arguments about war on terror um, and will use that rhetoric themselves, not just France, which was mentioned before. Um, but uh, if, if we look more deeply into it, we'll see they're using that as political argument. They're not accepting it as a correct legal definition uh, of war. And they're generally sticking to a much narrower, much more traditional view of, uh, of law of armed conflict, in fact, I'd be tempted to say traditional American view of law of armed conflict um, uh, uh, and of application of Geneva Conventions. So uh, how has this manifested itself? Well, I'll just give a series of areas that have come through. Uh, one, and of course, we know from the discussions that occurred uh, about the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence report on uh, torture and uh, black sites. Yes, I will use the torture word. Um, uh, uh, it uh, identifies uh, the enhanced interrogation techniques, or EITs, um, and, and uh, uh, catalogs their use, drawing out a tremendous amount of detail about these things. It also maps the creation of the black site. So of course we have two huge international law issues there going, I'd say, broadly uh, to uh, torture. Um, and other uh, inhumane uh, tactics, but certainly waterboarding uh, and several of the other tactics would be broadly considered torture, have been accepted as torture by the United States historically, both before and after uh, the Bush administration. Uh, but then I think also the establishment of black sites is a particularly difficult question under international law. So it constitutes if these black sites are created in such a way that the people disappear, their whereabouts is unknown, they are being held and detained for protracted periods uh, outside of any criminal justice administration or any accountability uh, to courts, that arguably is a disappearing. Uh, that's something, of course, that the United States uh, itself charged at the end of uh, World War II as a crime against humanity. Uh, so that raises, I think, particularly serious and fundamental questions. The Senate Select Committee report itself lays out a lot of these basic facts, doesn't get into a discussion of the uh, international law issues that are presented here. It does focus mostly on efficacy, um, now, and efficacy of, of techniques or the detention systems is not, however, I would say, uh, an international law issue. But beyond that, we have a series of others. In addition to this CIA detention and interrogation regime, we have the regime that, that Matt uh, Waxman was involved in operating, uh, which was under the aegis of the Department of Defense, uh, the Guantanamo facility, but also Abu Ghraib and other facilities uh, in uh, various theaters of conflict. Uh, we have interrogation techniques which were approved and used uh, there. We have uh, the issue of military tribunals uh, being used uh, to try uh, prisoners. We have the issue of indefinite detention. Each of these raises very significant and important issues uh, under international humanitarian law. So in the case of military commissions, for instance, I'd say broadly uh, international humanitarian law would accept military commissions as a way of trying prisoners uh, captured in a, a military controversy uh, for uh, criminal acts. But the extent to which the, uh, uh, the holding, the detaining power, departs from its own standards for military justice that develops for its own personnel and develops a different set of standards and improvises on those standards, um, then the less likely it is that those standards would pass muster uh, under the Geneva Conventions. Um, and we have the, importantly, I think also the question of indefinite detention. You can detain someone for the duration of a conflict, but can you detain them forever? Well, I think this is part of the reason for arguing for a forever war, uh, that it expands that, uh, that, that right of detention. I think they're very fundamental questions of whether that's legitimate and whether it can be squared with existing international law standards. Uh, targeted killings 
And drone war is another very important area. I mean, it comes up under constitutional law, um, as we've just been reminded. Um, it also raises very fundamental issues under international humanitarian law. Uh, and I, I would say it, uh, it gives us a good example of policies commenced in the Bush era, which were carried forward on a pretty much direct line of development uh, into the Obama years. But the major international law issue that I see, it's certainly not whether the president has the power to order the extrajudicial execution of a US citizen. There may be constitutional law issues there that would not be an international humanitarian law issue, I do not think. But um, the CIA's control over drones and its operation of this program on a sustained basis, particularly in areas like Pakistan, where the war has gone on for 10 years, involved hundreds of strikes um, and thousands of casualties, potentially, that does raise very fundamental questions. Because from the, from the contemplation of international humanitarian law, this is a system, or this is a, a, a weapon system and tactic that should be under the control of uniformed military. Uh, and not civilian forces uh, or intelligence forces. Uh, similarly, uh, security contractors uh, or mercenaries are a big issue that developed uh, in the course of the Gulf War and that it carried forward. We had an exceptionally large number of security contractors uh, who were, who were uh, deployed uh, and introduced in Iraq and later in Afghanistan. In fact, in Afghanistan to the point where they actually begin to outnumber uh, the uniformed uh, soldiers. The international law question that arises here, maybe there's some questions about the legitimacy of their use, but the definition of mercenary under international law has been defined so tightly, so narrowly, that it's uh, uh, pretty easy to get around that prohibition. But there's a big issue about, um, uh, about enforcing uh, criminal law and the law of armed conflict with respect uh, to these contractors. Uh, we have a very large number of, uh, uh, of individuals who are involved in lethal incidents and deaths, rapes, uh, and other violent crimes. Very, very few cases uh, where there was actually any prosecution. The highest profile prosecution, of course, was Nisor Square. It was an incident in which 17 individuals um, uh, were killed. Um, and that ultimately led, after many, many false starts, to prosecution and a series of uh, guilty verdicts. But the part of the problem we have there was a failure of US law and US legislation to provide a clear basis uh, for US action that appears to have been cleaned up. So this is one area where I think we've seen some progress. So I think that's, that would be it. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. I actually have uh, some questions, but I will not ask them and let the audience ask questions first. Um, so let me open this up to the audience for questions, please. Raise your hand. And, uh, okay, well then you're letting me ask my question. We covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> all right, they're irrefutable. Um, all right, so I guess one question I would have for Mr. Fifner, which would be whether the uh, your critique of the lack of separation of powers is is uh, completely just given the typical discretion that the president has in foreign affairs, and so um, or whether you think that is part of the problem here that there's too much emphasis on the president in foreign affairs and that the problem is that the other branches need to reassert themselves. Um, and then I have a question for Swarton, but I'll start with you. Well, I think if you just read the Constitution, uh, Article 1, uh, Section 8, and all of the uh, foreign affairs uh, issues that Congress, or I mean the, the convention, Constitution decided to give to Congress uh, that the King of England did not have, or did have, they decided to take away from the King, give it to Congress, I think that that uh, is, is very revealing, and the executive power in the vesting clause, uh, I think, is and the commander in chief uh, is relatively narrow compared to those. Uh, and so, my you know, in, in times of uh, uh, national security threats, things naturally move towards the executive. But I think that the tendency on executives is to continue that uh, after the immediate threat is there, uh, and that's where I think. The, the, the problem is in terms of interpretation, in terms of Congress being, well, I think polarization is something that the framers did not foresee, uh, and that makes a big chunk of Congress always ready to support uh, their president, and that makes it more difficult for Congress as an institution to reassert its, its own constitutional powers. And just uh, related to that um, for Professor Horton, um, 
Do you think the problem really was the lack of the war versus criminal law splitting, or is it a more fundamental problem from your perspective of the institutions, the, the p domestic institutions not checking? I guess I'm wondering whether you think it would have made a difference for policy if, uh, if the Bush administration had said, well, you know, we're going to follow a criminal law approach, or was it inevitable that this would be the path they rose unless there was some structural constitutional restriction on them? I guess how much work does the fact that they went to the law of war technique as opposed to criminal law approach make a difference, do you think, in how things turned out? I, I think when you, you know, I, I, my, my thinking about this is, is influenced a lot by talking to a lot of these Europeans who got disparaged earlier in the, in the last panel. Uh, and, uh, and I guess one of the fundamental criticisms I hear from them, which I think is a correct criticism, is that the political rhetoric overtook sound legal analysis of these points. So we have political rhetoric in the United States, which was focused for many, many years on you know, political culture of law and order, stern, aggressive uh, enforcement of, of, uh, uh, of criminal justice rules, but also expression of lack of confidence in the ability of the system to function proper, properly, uh, a profound concern that guilty people regularly were not convicted, whereas in fact, of course, the United States puts more people per capita uh, in prison than I think at this point any other country in the world. Um, uh, and, and including now, I would say, an awful lot of clearly innocent people go to prison as a result of our plea bargaining system. So I think that political, that political criticism um, was an important part of uh, the political dialogue in the country, and I think it shaped the reaction uh, to uh, the 9-11 events and uh, drove the government to use not only the language of war, uh, but also to begin to conceive of that in terms that were more technically legal. And then when presented with the problems that that meant, because you, give, you say people are prisoners taken in the conflict, then you've got the Geneva Convention uh, issues to deal with. It then led to an extraordinary drive to get around those rights, which I think was very, very destructive. Uh, and this is something, and I think, by the way, uh, it's not mutually exclusive. So I think, uh, you know, using criminal justice as a way to deal with terrorists, prosecuting them uh, and imprisoning them over the long term for their criminal acts does not mean you can't use the military uh, and bombers or drones to strike with them in your defense. But it means that after they're taken at a certain point, they're handed over to the criminal justice system. Uh, that, that still strikes me as a far more fundamentally sensible problem that gets a, a, a approach that gets around problems like the forever detainee who never faces uh, charges and gets around I think what I consider to be you know the embarrassing failure of actual uh, successful prosecutions uh, coming out of the Guantanamo process uh, there's really in my view no explanation for that the uh, Syria the people who were involved in serious terrorist events, should have been prosecuted, should have been convicted. And in fact, those uh, events should have been a showcase for the United States, just as they were at the end of World War II. And, and I think the Bush administration did uh, prosecute lots of terrorists in Article III courts and convicted most of them. Uh, but now uh, President Obama is uh, prohibited from doing that. OK, and unless there are more questions to the audience, I do have one more question for the panelists, both of them to reflect on. Is there anything, you know, that one of the purposes, at least as I saw it of the conference, was to take some space, seven years, or was there seven years from the time, whether, whether there's anything that's changed about how you view the decisions or the, the policies administration, given what's happened in the past seven years, and how the Obama administration may or may not have followed some and, and, and dropped some. And, and so has there, is there anything that has changed, you think, from, say, your view of things, uh, things in 2008 versus your view of things in 2015? I'll start with uh, James. Have it, has anything About your changed? view of the administration's policies, uh, you know, you're maybe more positively, more negatively. Given the argument that oh, I think many of the folks in the administration have made that the, Bush, the Obama administration has continued several or many of the policies, right. does that in any way affect your, your assessment of the Bush administration I, th I think the Bush administration did change its policies from first to second term, and I think a number of people have made that point, and I think that that's 
uh, legitimate and, and, and reasonable point. But I also think that uh, it's a separation of powers issue. The framers are right. Executives want more power. And, and President Obama has pushed it not quite as far in some areas, a bit further in other areas. Uh, so my perspective is still sort of a bit skeptical of uh, executive power and uh, uh, a push or feeling more towards uh, separation of powers and, and rule of law, either Bush or Obama. I, I think, you know, Julian, I think you and I were both at, at a panel discussion, I think at the law school here, in, uh, around the 2008 election, talking about the way uh, the election would affect these uh, policy decisions. Uh, and I, I said there that I thought many of Obama's supporters would be surprised by how little change there would be in national security. And I, I think there are many different reasons for that. I mean, well, one of them is that, you know, Obama as a president is someone who puts great emphasis on domestic policy and not national security. I think he views that as sort of a loser issue, which he would rather avoid. That leads to an attitude of putting the state more on autopilot. But another aspect, I think, is um, the nature of our dual state. Uh, we're used to seeing elections as a forum for debate of policies, policy A, policy B, and then uh, an assumption that the candidate that wins then implements their policies. That's nonsense. I mean, anyone who really uh, tracks presidencies over a long time, and I'd say particularly in the national security area, knows that that's just not true, that you know, so many of these, that in fact the policy options are of necessity always far more subtle than appear in presidential debates, that in fact um, uh, the apparatus will always work and strain to preserve the maximum flexibility for any president who prevails, and therefore will also will always act on the basis of any prior precedent that expands presidential authority to attempt to hold on to it. So I, I think actually what's happened is more or less exactly what I thought would happen. Okay, uh, one question from the audience. Did you, did you hear a mic or if not? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I, th I think David Adler is, is right on this. Uh, the back off was in terms of policy and implementation. It was not back off in terms of principle. And in fact, uh, President Obama has not backed off in terms of principle very much, although he certainly has in terms of uh, policy. I, I think, you know, looking at the detention and black side issue, which was highlighted in the prior panel, I mean, this is an area where, you know, clearly there was a shift. I mean, and if we look at, again, all the wealth of information and detail that came out in that Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence report, one of the things I was looking at is, you know, so where does this decision inside the CIA in 2006 to seek a change come from? And we see references to some sort of some studies going on, but perhaps not being completed. We don't see documents in the end. There's, there's definitely still a big gap there as to how this happened. But clearly there was a push 
both within the agency and I think coming from Condoleezza Rice, frankly, also coming according to the report from President Bush himself to push back on some of these changes. And we get that very dramatic final session of the National Security Council approving the walk back of many of these decisions uh, where you go around the room, and I think John Rizzo has described this, the, the former general counsel of the CIA, in detail watching it on TV, where the only voter who casts aggressively a no vote is Dick Cheney. So I, and I think that tells you something. So, so I think Cheney is connected with some of the more aggressive ideological perspectives. And I think we see a shift in the political sands in which he's more on the outside, certainly in the last two years of the second term. OK, well, um, with that, is there any last words you want to jump in on? Or I think, if not, I really want to thank, so, thank you so much to both of you for your patience. And for your great presentations. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we're off now for uh, for a dinner break. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Oh, I should just buy a copy. Of the book. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.